Folks, thanks very much for coming, and I would also like to thank the Ash for the honor of selecting our work for presentation in this setting. We're working on a treatment, and we hope a cure, for the most common genetic diseases on Earth, uh, beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. Right now, there is a cure. Um, it's called a bone marrow transplant. The way you do that is you take one of these millions of patients, and you find a bone marrow donor, and then you do the transplant. And it sounds very easy, but the logistics are that finding a donor can be quite hard, and in many cases impossible, and that the bone marrow transplantation procedure, as any clinician will tell you, has substantial clinical risk. So our plan is to have each patient be her or his own donor. The approach is to take blood stem cells, do something called genome editing, and I will explain shortly what that is, and then return the cells to the patient when we hope to achieve um, either a treatment or a cure. Oh, the, the, the background on this changed, so I'll, I'll just talk through this. Um, I'm, I was going, I, I'm using this uh, classic um, piece of art to uh, highlight uh, the beautiful basic science that underlies our approach. Uh, so in the bloodstream of mom, there is, of course, pointer, no pointer. Okay, never mind. No, I think it's because, oh, there we go, thank you, sir. So in the bloodstream of mom, there are, of course, erythrocytes, uh, red blood cells, and they have adult hemoglobin. Now, um, the baby also has hemoglobin, the baby there, but um, it's a different hemoglobin. It's called fetal hemoglobin. And the reason our genome evolved to contain and two separate genes for hemoglobin and to produce two different forms of the protein, adult and fetal, is the following. So mom breathes air, but the baby breathes through mom's bloodstream. And so the baby needs a specialized fetal hemoglobin to be able to carry enough oxygen to its tissues. And that fetal hemoglobin has a different affinity for oxygen. So um, in a baby, the two genes are next to each other. In a baby, um, the fetal gene is on, and the adult gene is off. In mom and in all of us here in this room, the fetal gene is off and the adult gene is on. So the deep irony for a person with sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia is uh, the adult gene which is on is mutant or defective and it causes disease. And in the genome there is, a, if you will, a spare tire, a perfectly functional gene for a globin which in principle could be curative but unfortunately the person cannot you know, to continue the metaphor of a tire, open the trunk and retrieve that spare tire to re replace the flat. So our approach, and um, Jeremy Rupon, who will speak after me, will also touch on this, uh, is to use something called genome editing, I'll explain in a second what that is, to wake up the fetal globin gene, and thus um, alleviate the, or cure the patient's symptoms. So what exactly are we going to be, quote, editing, unquote? Well. A huge amount of work um, has gone into understanding what causes this change in gene expression. Uh, in particular, I'd like to highlight the work of Dr. Stuart Orkin um, at Dana-Farber and Harvard. And in brief, collapsing a decade of work to one schematic, uh, it has to do with a protein called BCL11A. BCL11A. And what it does is it silences um, the fetal globin gene in you and I. Now here is the best part, and here's what's relevant to this presentation. Um, there are rare individuals um, in whom symptoms of their sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia are much milder than you expect. And this is because not only do they have the disease-causing mutation, but they also have a mutation in BCL11A. And as a result, their fetal globin gene is on, and their disease symptoms are much, much milder or sometimes eliminated. So our approach to the clinic is to take a patient who is not that fortunate and doesn't have that BCL11A mutation and actually make it de novo. So take a patient's stem cells, um, get rid of the BCL11A gene in them, and then put the cells back into the patient and hope for a permanent lifetime elevation of fetal globin. 
Now, I realize that to some of you, the notion of changing in a targeted fashion a DNA in a person's cells might seem slightly futuristic. Let me assure you it is not. Uh, we have, are in the process of doing several clinical trials in which we're doing genome editing of the CCR5 gene, uh, which is located on chromosome 3, and uh, the clinical trial is focused on HIV AIDS. And just to illustrate to you the reality of it all, that's one of our 35 subjects on the right there. So uh, genome editing is a little bit like Microsoft Word or um, Macintosh Pages if you use a Mac. Uh, for the genome, if you want to change um, human DNA in living cells, um, you do the biological equivalent of point and clicking and then hitting control X on a segment of genetic text. Um, you build a designer protein called a zinc finger nuclease, and it binds to the BCL11A gene, uh, which is right there, and gets rid of it in, this, in the person's own cells with, uh, as I'm about to show, pretty remarkable efficiency. Um, I should say that I, I did my uh, training in um, academia, then spent the past 13 years of my life in industry, but a majority of the work that we do stands on the shoulders of giants of academic science, and this gives me the wonderful opportunity to credit um, the mar marvelous scientists who have done uh, the foundational work that led to the development of what we're doing at Sangamo, uh, from Aaron Klug, who discovered the zinc finger, to Carl Pabo, who proposed that uh, solid structure and proposed that it can be designed, to Maria Jason, who um, developed editing via break, and <clears throat> last but not least, uh, Dana Carroll, who did, and, and developed zinc finger nucleases, and all of that ultimately led to our development of human genome editing. Well, how does editing actually work? You build the zinc finger nuclease, and it binds to a target gene, and then it creates a double-strand break, so it cuts it. And then what Mother Nature then does for us is it repairs the break. But the marvelous thing is the cell makes a mistake and creates a typo in the gene and as a result produces a knockout. Um, in a clinical setting, this requires a lot of additional technology, much of which was developed by the many wonderful people who are here at the ASH right now. So we take a patient, we bring them to the clinic, uh, we harvest their stem cells, uh, then we treat the cells with uh, the zinc finger nucleases, and we induce, um, and then we uh, uh, put the cells back in. So when we actually do that, what happens? Let me show you one piece of data, and then I'll be done. So we take up to 300 million um, blood stem cells from a patient. Is that a lot, you will ask? Well, that's enough to pre treat pretty much any person. Then we do genome editing to knock out BCL11A. We make red blood cells. And uh, before they lose their nucleus, which of course red blood cells do, we measure genome editing. And I'm going to show you a gel, and I'm happy to answer questions about it later if you want. Um, this gel shows that we obtain in a single step 80%. Eight zero single step targeted genome editing in human hematopoietic stem cells. You will ask me, well, is that impressive? Well, to be blunt, yes, this is without precedent. E efficiencies of that scale have never been achieved in the history of biology. Um, I was once asked by a TV journalist how I feel about these data, and I didn't think, I just said what came to mind. I said, well, it feels like I'm in a Star Trek movie. Um, and I was then laughed at by my students because apparently Star Trek is quite ancient. So um, I don't know what movie this feels like being in. I suppose the one that comes to mind is that sequence in Singing in the Rain when Gene Kelly dances through puddles with joy. And I assure you that this is what was happening at Sangamo when we got data like this, because this is a moment for true, true, true celebration that we can do this with such efficiency. Um, I'm sorry you can't see this very well, um, but there's also a reason. These are erythrocytes um, made in a dish, and they are stained for fetal globin, and you can't really see much because these are just normal erythrocytes until we do genome editing to knock out the BCL11A gene. And the entire field of vision lights up because the erythrocytes are now laden with fetal globin, which we know will be disease curative. So in summary, last slide, and then I'm done. Um, I've shown you that we can knock out the BCL11A gene in human hematopoietic stem cells, that we can do this in a clinical process at an efficiency of up to 80% single step. Um, we observe a sustained and dramatic effect on fetal hemoglobin, and I'll show all the data in my talk tomorrow afternoon. In collaboration with George Stomatogonopoulos with the, at the University of Washington, we've shown that the genome edited cells survive in animal models. This, is a, this was a key result. And also in collaboration with Dr. Stomatogonopoulos, we were able to obtain very high efficiency of editing in cells from patients with beta thalassemia 
and with sickle cell disease. And last and most importantly, um, our goal is to file an investigational new drug application uh, to start clinical trials in 2014. Thank you.